share this with folks um, who are unable to make the Zoom meeting today, because I feel that this, this information that we're sharing today is very, very um, important for uh, Indigenous Caribbean peoples, uh, namely those of us who are, uh, I self-identify as Taino, Indigenous Caribbean, Afro-Indigenous Caribbean. Uh, okay, so Mabrika, Usa Nonu, Usa Kasikabo, everyone, Nelugno. Um, let's see here. I'm going to share my screen now. Can everybody see this? Yes. All right. Yeah. I'm not the type of person like, look, you're going to have to see my thumbnails. Uh, <laughs> I have a tendency to um, I have a tendency to kind of get lost when it's like full screen. So, so Mabrika, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brittany, for the introduction. Um, I am here speaking to you from Lenape uh, the rightful land uh, of the Lenai Lenape people. A brief overview for those of us who are here new to the Taino people. Um, you know, the Taino people or Indigenous Caribbean peoples um, uh, or the Indigenous peoples of the Greater Antilles, uh, their territories span uh, from Bimini, which is uh, Western Florida, to Boriqueng, and, and all around throughout, uh, and Yamaye, Jamaica. Boyo, ID, Kiskeya, um, Cuba, and a little bit of the Bahamas. So let's see here. I'm going to just go really quickly through this. Uh, we are also not the only uh, indigenous Caribbean people. There are the Kalina people, the Kalinago people, uh, and also the Filipino people who are uh, indigenous Caribbean folks. So we uh, are a matrilineal people. So I like to uh, talk about our people in the present tense. So we had the- Rusa, I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, I just heard somebody. Um, but uh, you know, we are matrilineal people. Uh, matriarchal, meaning it went uh, the, I guess, uh, uh, we went from mother to daughter in recognizing a family kin kinships and family kinships. So like, for example, if we were to marry or so on and so forth, uh, the, the uh, male masculine person in the family would come to the woman, femmes, female uh, persons, household and live with them and there you be again. So if that makes sense. So we're making lineal people, matriarchal people. Uh, we have villages uh, or called Yubiyekes throughout the islands and we lived in Boyo. And we had central plazas where we played uh, a ball game like Batu, called Batu. I've done this so many times, uh, sometimes I kind of like forget. <laughs> this, these are old slides, but it's always something something I, I, I forget to mention. So bear with me. <laughs> I've also been working all day. So, um, so the Taino people uh, like to create artwork. I mean, we still do. So we have um, uh, Luis Cadron, Cassian, who is a, a wonderful ceramicist who's with us today. Uh, he's gonna be one of the people speaking. So um, I like to say we create artwork like today. I'm an artist as well. Uh, but here before you, you see some ancestral pieces. So you see some semi, uh, you see some petroglyphs, you'll see some vessels. And those are things that you'll a lot of times see that in the museums, they were stolen from our homeland and they're propped up in a museum behind glass, uh, glass cages and, and things of that nature. But, you know, uh, Taino people are still making artwork today everywhere. So, 
these are some of the instruments that are influenced by the, um, uh, I wouldn't say influence. These are the instruments that influence a lot of the music that you hear in the Caribbean today. So we have the wido, we have the mayokan, we have the maracas and ambaraca. And ambaraca is uh, the piece that you see on the lower right hand corner. It's made from one single piece of wood and it's whittled down, little, little, little down all the way till there's uh, in the inside, there's like this little um, piece that finally breaks off once you whittle all of it down. And it's made from one singular piece. So it's not like placed together, put together like the um, regular maracas that usually it's made from the board and a stick that's placed within the word, and then sometimes it has seeds inside or stones. And my wagon is the wooden log drum that we see here. Now, uh, we are gonna talk about this a little bit later, but there's some words that survive uh, today that we say every day, whether in Spanish, English, or even all over the world, a lot of people still um, say these words like yuca. Um, they use a lot of yuca in the Southeast Asia for a lot of food preparation, uh, but it's indigenous uh, to the Caribbean uh, and Central South America. And also uh, the word yuca is, is Daino Arawak. Um, potato, which, batata, which is kind of like the sweet potato, um, barbacoa, uh, we cook with the barbecue, um, huracan, hurricane, vanilla. And these are a lot of things that um, many people uh, have learned along the way. Uh, when I first uh, devised these slides about 10 years ago or something, it was still kind of like a lot of people didn't really know a lot about, uh, a lot about this. But because of social media and because the explosion of like TikTok and a lot of really fun mediums like that, uh, a lot of people are starting to discover uh, uh, these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things. So I wanted to actually show you, uh, you know, you see these older pictures and these pictures that are engraved from like the 1600s, but I want to show you something that's a little bit more recent, um, comparatively like quote unquote modern history. So we're talking about, I mean, it's still old, but it was still like not the 1500s. So a lot of times you'll hear, um, you'll hear like in your textbooks or when you were growing up that, that all the Taino died out in the 1500s because the Spaniards said so. Because the Spaniards said, because the colonizers said that all of the Taino died out. <laughs> And that's like, that, that word is bond, that's gospel, right? And so, uh, no, we uh, still, not necessarily that, you know, but all indigenous Caribbean people are still here. And there's plenty of records and there's plenty of documentation. Uh, if you look for it, if you search it for it, you'll see it's, a, it's really hidden in plain sight. It's just um, a lot of times when they are talking about when they are talking about uh you know our people uh they usually use a little bit of code words here and there they won't necessarily say indigenous or something like that but they'll say like native but not necessarily indigenous so this is um getting uh, the garifuna people here for uh, preparing cassava in saint vincent which is one of the um, smaller islands of the Lesser Antilles in 1903. And you can see the cassava bread up top here, drying. Here's an 1892 portrait uh, of a man who was identified as an indigenous um, Jamaican person. So these are like, these are like, photographs, you know, it's not like old engravings or anything like that. These are, um, are people, of course, you know, were documented as being indigenous or being native. Um, 
in some spaces and in others there are uh, a lot of these a lot of these images were just hidden so this is a famous sort of a famous photo of a woman um, Luisa uh, Gainza, uh in Cuba from 1919 and a child unknown children now this is a clipping that I found uh, this is an exhibition, school children, an exhibition of native industry, and the second unit, rural schools of Puerto Rico uh, in 1930. And as you can see, you see children here, um, Borico children here, and they're uh, weaving baskets. And they're actually um, continuing something that, I mean, it's not really continued so much in Borican anymore, in, 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 larger, in a larger scale as it once was, but we did have it all the way up until the 20th century, a lot of these skills, right? All the way up until the 20th century. But the next slide, you'll see a basket weaving person uh, who is Kalinago, and they're living in um, just a few islands away. So it continues, a lot of these things continue uh, throughout the Caribbean, it's just that um, for a lot of reasons, uh, well, actually just one reason, colonialism, uh, these kinds of practices were, I, I, I would say, silence or squash. So let me go into my introduction here to our guests, our esteemed guests. So I'll take my notes out. <laughs> All righty, so our next guest here is uh, Luis Bastian Calderon, and he was born in North, um, no, I'm sorry, he was born in New York City uh, from Puerto Rican parents. Uh, he's been an active member in, within the Taino community since the late 1980s. Uh, and in New York City, uh, you know, he's been living in Borican, uh, since 1996, and he's still there today. So right now he's he's streaming in from Borikin. Uh, he received his BA in secondary education and history and a minor in music um, from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico in San Juan. Um, Cassian has studied Taino pottery with uh, Alish um, Chevere. Uh, um, Chevere, Chevere, Chevere. Chevere from Morovis, mm -hmm. thank you for correcting me, mm -hmm. for three years. And also studied contemporary uh, ceramics at uh, Centro Sor um, Isolina. Isolina Ferrer. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. you okay, all right, I'll get started on heating everything up. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you very much for correcting me. Um, he is, uh, also uh, received uh, recognition as an artisan and is an uh, artist representing the island culture from the Institute of um, the Puerto Rican culture. Puerto Rican culture. <laughs> and has been working as a professional artist and ceramicist okay. for 20 plus years. The artist uh, lives and thrives mm -hmm. with his wife, Anna, and their two dogs, Luna and Neva, in the southern town of Juan Diaz in Puerto Rico. And I'm going to show some of Cassian's work. So here is some cups, a beautiful teacup here, a ceramic bowl, another really fun teacup. I love the colors in this one. And then next up, I'm going to introduce Basike Balan Niborish Baman from the Yuki Yaki Yame Waini. Sorry, I get tongue tied, y'all. English, is, uh, let me see, language is not my strong suit. So I like to draw and paint. That's why I'm an artist. 
but somebody has to do this. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Cacique Robert Galan Herman. Uh, first and foremost, a Bique, who is uh, a Taino medicine person. Uh, he was chosen and appointed as a Cacique uh, for the Amaye uh, Waini, the Jamaican hummingbird Taino people. He now walks with the Taino name uh, Nibonish Kaman. Uh, did I say that right? Did I say that correctly? Okay, thank you. Cacique Kaman uh, is a member of the Council of Ancestral Indigenous Medicine of the Americas and the main organizer for the Caribbean Region Peace and Dignity Journeys, which is an intertribal spiritual run connected to ancient prophecies of the Americas. Okay. And let's see, also a member of, you have to help me here. <laughs> the uh, the R-E-O-G-K-Q-A-W, right? Which is the original uh, spirit, spiritual uh, responsibilities of um, why you're Oi, okay, Kunter, Katsal, and Agia, and Warwa. Is that right? Okay, awesome. I did it right. <laughs> With responsibility for maintaining traditional ceremonies in the Caribbean and sits on the Yamaya Jamaican Council of Indigenous Elders. So we have Ivan here. In his headdress that was uh, crafted, was created by um, another cacique. I, I think this is his work. Is this uh, Jorge Estevez's work? No, this is somebody else. Okay, I'm sorry. Scratch that. <laughs> so, another person's work. <laughs> Here is an article from Jamaica um, of, of him being uh, appointed by the grandmothers, the grandmother council as as uh, cacique. And here is uh, the cacique uh, in the participation of the 2016 Peace and Dignity Journeys Intra Travel Program. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing. I hope I did okay. Did I do okay, everybody? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you did. You're doing great. Don't worry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, words are not my strong suit, but thank you. But a fool me, you did great. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, okay, so right now to the questions. And I would actually like to um, ask my first question to Cassian. Mm -hmm. um, on page 24 of the book, um, the book we're referencing, My Broken Language, the author's middle name, Ale Ale Alegria. Alegria, sí was chosen as a name after Ricardo Alegria, who uncovered Alegria. Mm -hmm. Taino ceremonial grounds before him. But before him, the uh, indigenous roots had been silenced in the island of Borique. As one of the first people to identify as indigenous Caribbean Taino back in the 1980s, or like kind of not identify, but publicly identify, let's, mm -hmm. let's kind of like, get that clear, publicly identify and come out as an indigenous um, Taino back in the 1980s. What uh, was the influence and driving force to reclaim your indigenous identity at that time? Well, I think that for Tainos were our indigenous people that were oppressed and executed and uh, uh, pr practically vanished but they hid within their families and their families passed on that information. 
And we're not the only one that's done that in the past because I'm, I'm a historian. Uh, the crypto Jews also. Here in the Caribbean, the African peoples, when you talk about religion, they hide their religion in Santeria, you know? But we did that within our families, you know? The Tainos didn't die. They just transformed themselves to what they call the Hibaro. You know the Hibaro means the red man from the mountain. Well, those individuals kept passing on that information. See, si somos Tainos, losing our language many times. We, we couldn't speak it publicly. Our people were persecuted religiously. So even to identify as Taino was to be against the church practically because we had our own belief system and our own religion. And that transformation was to make the Taino or the Hibaro, okay? Catholic and Christian. So we had to keep that quiet. And we kept it quiet up to this point in time. And what happens is that Taino people who knew that information and went to the United States to live, they started hanging around Native Americans within the American community. And they started speaking with them and they started going to powwows and they started participating. And one of the first peoples that accepted us as indigenous, while our families laughed and our society laughed, were the Native American people at the powwows and even at, um, at a uh, religious and ceremonial activities. They accepted us. I knew Tainos that were pipe carriers within the Lakota nation. I don't know, I, I remember him uh, being this individual when I first started in the late eighties, when I first, I, I always personally knew that I was native because the information that my parents gave me, the information that I found out, the physical genetic, the, the, the shovel teeth, the uh, the stain when you're an infant, um, and uh, I knew, and I wanted to identify because I did some research when I was in the university, and I found out that there are Caribs living in Dominica. So how can we, we we have passed away? Me personally, I was going to John Jay College University, and I was I was doing a project, and the project was the Taino Indians, you know, get historical background and whatnot. And a young woman that I knew that I'm still friends with, uh, um, Teresita Rivera, turned me on. She goes, listen, for your information that you want to do, I knew a group of people that gather in Alphabet City in New York City. These people go around saying that they're really Indian. And they have, like, they're, when you go there, it's like they're, they're, they even speak some other language and they sing songs. <laughs> And they have a real semi there. I was like, I was like, really? I, I couldn't believe it. Well, I met those people. Finally, I met them at a meeting. And it was like I met my family. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I'm like, but you really are dying. I mean, they had a council of 12. For you to join them, you had to have a, a meeting with each one of them to get into your head to, to find out what you wanted. What did you want to do with this? And I was schooled very well by these 12 elders. They're still around. Domingo Hernandez is one of them. Maria, some of you guys know them. Um, they're still around. Um, but when we met, when I met, it was it was an incredible. It was, it is the 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 thing that turned and motivated completely changed my life, you know. And those were my people. And, and we used to go to, this is before the internet. We used to go to meetings. People would bring information, video, I mean, copied on Xerox machines, you know? We gathered in, in, uh, in the parks. We gathered, that was during the spring in, 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 different, low, in different places. In El Barrio, they invited us. Um, uh, a Puerto Rican cultural center also invited us. We had meetings. And it was really, really, really positive. That's when, 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 when I discovered not only who I was, but I had a community. And from then on, it kept going and kept going and kept going to the point that me, now, me personally, now I live, I live and thrive on the island, you know. But it was a long, long journey, and it was great. And it's some hardships, and we had things that that or oh, obviously with the today's technology, we don't have any, we don't have no more. But people sacrificed. 
they they really wanted to be Taino. They really wanted to identify um, with the with the the Native American community. They were very active in the Native American community, and some of them were in, were in councils. These are, these are Puerto Ricans. You're like, wow, is it, it's just some Boricua. I mean, what's going on here? But they were very active, and they were really they were on fire, you know. And some of them kept attending uh, Native American ceremonial circles, you know, mm -hmm. and some of them kept going to powwows. I was part of the Arawak Mountain Singers. I was I was a Taino group who sung and and, and did powwow music in the our language, and and we did music. And we, I was a professional musician. I was paid to do that. That's how professional they got. That's it started cool. off with two guys. And kept going to three, four, and then we kept going, and we kept going, we kept going, and those where we met, we met a lot of contacts, a lot of beautiful people, a lot of native beautiful people from all over the Americas and Canada. It was incredible. It was really a great learning experience. Even my sister, who passed away, was was uh, she became she became really active in the Taino community. So yeah, it was it was. Uh, it's uh, something that is not impossible. Listen, the bottom line is that you have to identify. Native America is nothing if you don't identify. We're human beings, we have to identify. The Chinese people identified as Chinese people. If the Chinese people didn't identify as Chinese, they said, well, we're Asians. No one would know who Chinese people are. You have to identify. And yes, it is a sacrifice. We went to hell and back identifying as Taino. We were laughed at. Personally, I was laughed at within members of my own family. They called me crazy horse behind my back. Hmm. You know, that was it. That was the stereotypes are still there. It's still, and believe me, living in Puerto Rico is just like living in the United States when it comes to being Native American. It really is. We have mascots with Native American names with Taino y Cacique. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So I believe that, you know, as Taino people, we have to struggle and we have to we have to return to the Caribbean. At least if we don't we live there, we should return every year to get that contact there. But um, it's not easy. It's been a, 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 a royal ride. It's been really great. But uh, um, what made me, you know, what again, back to the question, what makes us who we are is our ancestors told us. Abuelita, abuelito, your father, mother, quietly. The reason why, for two reasons. In, in the past, it was because of religious persecution by the Spanish government. And then we have what we call in the Latino community, that type of attitude that, ¿Qué, qué la gente va a pensar en mí? What are people going to say about me? We have that. So identify, ¿qué es un indio? Wow, what is your case? Are you kidding me? It's real. It's real. It's not, it's not a joke. Yeah. And when you identified in the early days, when we identified, man, we were called everything. We really were. And it was really tough, you know. But this is the modern world, and I don't believe in living back in the mountains of Puerto Rico and quietly. That's that's over with. That's gone. It's no longer, that's not gonna, that's not gonna continue anymore. We're gonna go forward. And whatever price we have to pay, nothing was compared to what our ancestors had to go through, you know? You know, just because I call you something or a name, it may hurt, but you know what it is physically being, they destroy you physically in your family for identifying. Hmm? That pressure really isn't one that, that compared to our ancestors, and that should be our that, that should be our goal and our nothing, nothing, nothing was what our ancestors went through. Yeah. What the history books wrote about throwing our children onto spears was real. Whether we like it or not. Thank we could never much. okay. Thank right. you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um Cassian, were you about to add something else or no no no. Okay. Just the realities. That was okay. All right. I answered your question, I think. Yes. Thank you very much. No, that was, that's a lot to ponder. You've, you've given us a lot to really think about and a lot to ponder. Not only did you take us through, um, you know, your own personal experiences, but you also took us 
which is very, very important, the very beginning of the, re the Taino resurgence. And a lot of people don't know about that history. And I think that we should really revisit that more. Like maybe that should be an, a whole series altogether, just like to hear stories about that. I would really like to do that. That's, uh, you know, in my, my head. <laughs> Taino, Taino tea time with uh, with Luis <laughs> Taino tea time. <laughs> We're ready for when you come over. You're spending some time with us over here in one of the years. Okay, I will. I will. Well, thank you. Oh. So, um, to you, Cacique Galan, um, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, the title of the book is uh, "My Broken Language." And on page 238, 238, um, some Taino words were referenced in the book as being used in everyday Spanish and English vocabulary. In what ways are you reclaiming and reconstructing the Taino Arawak language? And why do you think it's so important? Uh, how home to thank you, my sister. I mean, I'd start with greeting everybody here in this space. Um, as I was taught to do and, you know, asking for that ancestral guidance as we move forward. And to answer your question, I'd say that, first of all, it's for me to look at language on a whole, you know, language is how we express ourselves and we express our thought. It can be in art, it can be in words, it can be in story, in film, in play, in dance. And the importance of or our spoken language is that it carries with it so much, so many messages, so much medicine as it relates to our culture. So on our island here, what we are, we're part of a language resurgence group, uh, Kasabi clan, and there is a lot of work that is being done with our relatives, the Garenagu, Garefuna, Lokono, and really putting together the, the root, because once we find the root, then we'll be able to understand better the different branches and how it is that we arrived at these points that we're at. So for example, us in Jamaica, um, we have an endemic animal called the coney. The coney in Borinquen and Kiskea is called the hutia. In some other places, it's called aguti. Now there's only one other place that calls it the coney, and that is in Suriname. So we understand that we have a close connection with the Lokono of Suriname. And that helps us to piece things together with our relatives in South America. It helps with the language. I remember when I had just joined the Council of Indigenous Healers of the Americas, and they were asking, what is the sacred bird in the Caribbean region? And I said, the water wall. And they just moved on you know, with the discussion. And I was expecting them to ask me questions and be like, what is the water wow, whatever? So it's like, oh, so the water wow, you know, and I'm trying to interject while they're talking to, oh, you know, me again, the water wow is a red tail hawk. And they're like, yeah, we know. I'm like, so how you know what the water wow is? We have a place called water wow in Peru. And they just continued with the meeting. And I'm saying, wow, I, I had no idea. So the more we have these connections with our relatives, the more that we understand the languages, the more that we understand ourselves. Um, we, are, we, we don't use openly on a regular basis, you know, term for ancestral items like the manaya or the makana, but we call prickly thorns here in Jamaica, maca, right? So again, there's an understanding of the root. There is a plant here that we call tuna, right? And we understand that there's an indigenous root in that as well. There's, there's so much around language and a very important part of language is our stories. It was such a therapeutic thing for me to learn the stories of Inriri, of the woodpecker, the stories of the hobo tree, the stories of things that we're seeing every day. And I have been able to observe how that assists the young ones who, who feel displaced, who are trying to mark out their space in this world. Some who, you know, they, they've grown up in impoverished scenarios and their family may have sold their ancestral land. So they don't really feel a connection to this place. And language, stories help to anchor us to the space that we call home. So, you know, hopefully that, that answers the question somewhere. <laughs> oh, 
Cajon. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, language is very important and language reconstruction. And also, you know, cross-referencing with uh, Arawakan speakers who are speaking today, like every day, you know, um, Island Arawak, uh, which is Igneri, you know, the language of our ancestors is still being spoken by the Garifuna, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> you know, uh, we should really uh, sit down and talk more with our cousins. Uh, you know, the Lopono and the Garifuna. So definitely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. So back to Kassian. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your artwork. So uh, your artwork is a modern take on ancestral uh, ceramic pieces from the Caribbean. Uh, as you add your own unique and colorful style to them. Uh, who are your biggest influences? And what are your favorite types of pieces to create? My biggest influence. Uh -oh, did we lose you? Oh no. I can kind of hear you. So I'm uh, sorry, everyone. Uh, there's some technical difficulties. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay, my biggest influence is the beaded semi because the beaded semi as a piece establishes that our Taino people were, had a continuity. My pieces have a continuity to what our, our, the pieces that our ancestors did that you see in museums today. You see them, they don't have a lot of color. They don't, they don't have a lot of uh, shine or anything like that. So what I do is I, I add that to it and bring it up to speed to today, what we're doing today. As Taino people, we have to understand that that's what we have to do. You know, we have to bring what we know to what, what it is today because we are tiny people of today we're not 500 years ago we're not 200 years ago we're not 300 we are dino people of today and we're working for in the future from 500 years from now what will our what will our children's children's children look, be doing so as far as my ceramics are concerned that's what I use. I use the colors of today. I use the machinery of today, the technology of today. Because by if you know anything about the beaded semi, the uh, the face one of the faces uses rhinoceros horn. We didn't have no rhinoceroses in, in the Caribbean, so they took that, or they found it with the Spanish brong, and they, and they took that and they used it. And it's not traditional. But they use, but what, what can we learn from that? That they use what was accessible to them. They didn't bear down and say, well, this is the way we got to do things, you know? And if we don't do it that way, it's not, no. Taino people weren't that way. They used what they could use, you know? And the bottom line is that's what I'm using today. You know, I the, the root is the Taino. I could do Taino replicas in, uh, in uh, low fire clay, just like my ancestors did. Uh, burning premises that are you know here on the island do that because if you do that they call the cops on you and they call a bombero they come down you have a, a permit to I'm sorry um you're breaking up a little bit uh, Disconnecting again. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It's just disconnecting. This is just, but basically that's what it's all about. That's what my 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 Taino, you know, the Taino coffee mug. Our ancestors didn't use that. They used Ditas, you know. But yeah. I want to do something with ceramics and I want I want to make I want to bring it up to speed, you know. So that's what that's what it's all about with me. And I think that we have to understand as if we are Taino. We have to be a continuity, not stuck only in what our ancestors did. I don't think they would want that. They wouldn't want, you know, if our ancestors, if I could bring back any ceramicist 
and the majority of all ceramicists in our, in our ancestors' days were women. Huh? When we bring them back, they would be they they would work on the wheel. Why is this faster? <laughs> you know, doing coil pottery takes a while and it's more expensive. I know coil potters and their their stuff is more expensive because they take more time to do that pottery. You know, they would use they would mix any any type of uh, uh, type of uh, paint uh, uh, glazes and stuff like that. But that's what we have to do as as Taino people. You know. We're a continuity and we should use what is around us. That's what I learned. But my piece will always be the beaded semi, always for that lesson. It will always be the beaded semi. And it's not even a ceramic piece, <laughs> but that's what our ancestors left for us. And that's what I learned from it, so. Yeah, I love, I love that piece. Um, actually in the chat, if you are curious, um, the Bidesami Elba uh, had posted, thank you very much, Elba, posting the Bidesami there. Our ancestors were fierce beaters. So like, if you ever see like people like beating and things of that nature, we used to beat as well. And just like uh, um, Gassian had, had said to us, uh, you know, they used rhinoceros horns. So, let us see, if they were extinct, if they were truly extinct, you know, how would they get access to glass beads and rhinoceros horn? <laughs> you That's know, right. it, just, it blows right. your mind. Like the that was run by the professor here and our people used what was available to them and they, they did a beautiful job, you know? But the lesson there is that our ancestors, you, you know, bring it up to speed, bring it up to today, you know? Yeah. You know, so. And and uh, Casiga Calan had just uh, had put in in the chat a image of the Yami uh, Tangino table. Wow, that uh, the ancestors in Jamaica had had created. So interesting. Oh, tableware. Yes, I did see this. I did see this. So they were firing these pieces, but they were, were um, kind of like mimicking or kind of like um, duplicating what the Europeans were creating, but actually creating it in their own way. So it's very interesting. It's very interesting. There's a lot of history that has been kept from us that we have to search for. It's right there in plain sight. So Ahom. Thank you very much, Kassian. So our final mm -hmm. question. Yeah, thank you. That's your, I'm telling you, like, what, what was it, the Elder Scrolls? We have to, <laughs> it was mentioned in the chat that uh, it should be, uh, the podcast should be called the Elder Scrolls with Kassian <laughs> as our guest. I'm here to help my people, that's all. Hyeno Elder Scrolls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it, <laughs> copywritten, trademarked. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh -huh. So uh, finally, uh, the last question, then we're gonna open it up to Q&A um, for everybody. Um, finally, the last question. Uh, in the book, uh, My Broken Language, and this is for Cacique Calan. Um, the book references uh, food, farming, and land often. Uh, can you share some of the ways that you're introducing knowledge of the land and water to the youth in your community? And again, why do you think this is very important? Oh, wow. Um, that is one of my passions. So I will try to cut it down for Elder Scroll version two or volume two. Um, I'll start with or ceremonies, as I said, you know, I, I'm, I was first a behike and conducting ceremonies and our ceremonies and rituals, they connect us to the land, they connect us to the waters. And what we've been doing is sharing those teachings, sharing these ancestral ways, keeping records. So one of the things that we'll be having out before the end of the year is, you know, our ancestral calendar so that people can connect with that in a deeper way. It speaks towards what is happening on the island, what season. So the recent new moon for us would be Hurakan Kati, the hurricane moon. 
because we know that we're getting into the hurricane season. The moon before that was Huyakati, the start of the rainy season. And the more awareness that there is on these experiences and observances that our people always are going through, it helps them to move through these transitions in a conscious way, being mindful of what is taking place around them and they can understand their role and the position that they're in during these times. So for example, with the Huracan Kati, it's a point of clearing, it's a point of cleansing, it is a point of thanksgiving, it is a time where we're really giving thanks because in this time period, we we'll also have um, June 21st, for us, we call it Yukahuna Kachiareto, which is our celebration of, of Yukahu. And the yuca is one of the food that would survive the hurricane season as a strong tuba. And a part of our, our way of being is to, to try and mimic that strength, mimic that male energy of fertility, which is represented in the yuca and represented in that sun force that is strong on that day. So in all of these things, there are teachings that are empowering our youth, that we are promoting, practicing, and preserving. And I'm very happy that as of 2019, June 20th, the General Assembly at the United Nations recognized June 21st as the International Day of Celebration of the Solstice. And with it, it brought more awareness and opportunities for support for indigenous communities that are celebrating equinoxes, solstices, and equinoxes. Um, to specifically speak towards water, Again, sharing some insights because not a lot of people know about the ceremonies and the things that take place on our island. In March, we celebrate a period from the equilux, which is the actual day of equal day and equal night, to the equinox, which more people are, are more familiar with, which in the north is the start of spring. And during that time, it is honoring of waters falls. And we'll have stories about Wabonito, the great water spirit, and the healing and the cleansing that she brought, and with the rituals around rivers, giving thanks to our rivers. And um, we've started since last year uh, working with the, this organization, which celebrates March 14th, which is the day of the Equilox here in Jamaica, the Interna International Day of Action for Rivers. So when we do our rituals, we share it with that group, we share the imagery and the photographs, and it, it helps to you know, pump up the youth to become more active in how we are caretakers of the spaces that we reside. So we, we have an awareness of the way that our ancestors navigated life. We have an awareness of what it is that our environment is asking of us at this point in time. And it really encourages the young ones to slow down. You know, we, we spoke about language. And again, you know, I want to touch on the point that language is, language is how we express ourselves and we bring our, these thoughts and concepts to fruition. So I would consider art language. I would consider uh, the way that we deal with our crops, you know, culinary art language, music language, dance language. And all of these things, anybody that understands our culture is, is a part of who we are. All of these things are important when done in the correct context to keep in our youth for future generations awareness of, of who we are. The imagery behind me in the background is from one of our relatives, our white or the Maroon community of Charleston. And this mural basically depicts their ancestry as well. You know, you have on, on this side, or Yame Taino, who were greeting the colonizers with pineapples. And then you have the enslaved Africans that we worked with to create the Maroon communities that are part of the custodians of our spaces today, that we live in harmony with, we live in communion with as caretakers of these spaces, you know, blessed by the ancestors. So that's why I said there's so much to talk about, you know, um, the youth and getting them involved with land and protection of water. There's so much activity taking place internationally, and I have to take this opportunity to plug Planet Classroom that has an initiative of youth throughout the globe that has been putting forward information and interviewing climate activists, speaking towards you know, how we can hold these individuals accountable. We're at 2022, it is eight years to 2030 where they have all of these sustainable development goals. And the reality is that the key that the world is looking towards is in our indigenous teachings. We have been here the longest in the Americas and have been wonderful custodians of these spaces. The reality is, yes, there may be some birds and animals extinct, but a lot of them are still existing today. 
some of them still classified as extinct, but we still have our endemic species, which is to say a lot as compared to other species in the world. And I think what has happened is that because there are not many international forums where youth have an opportunity to, to have that type of exchange and their language barriers, the value that should be placed on these teachings, the value that should be placed on our language, you know, our culture, how we relate with each other, is not always there. And I guess the charge that I'd like to put out to all of those who are listening is to encourage the young ones to learn about these ways, to learn stories of the spaces in which you reside, to understand that, you know, if you are indigenous, then it's not about jumping in a time machine to the 1400s or the 1300s, that your grandmother, you know, look on the mirror, your grandmother, your great grandmother, and there are practices that they have done that have evolved. That's, that's why I share that imagery of, you know, the tableware, because the history for Jamaica is, is different from other islands. And here, we, our ancestors had to create the tools that the Spanish were using, and they were compensated for it. So they were creating Taino tableware, pictures and pots and tools that could fit on tables because the higuera and the other stuff that we had were round, so that wouldn't work very well. Once you pour some water in it, it would capsize on a table. So this is, you know, to speak to us the fact that continuity is there. And as my brother said, it is acknowledgement of that, that will help our people in identifying as who we are and preserving that for future generations. So a home for the opportunity to speak and to share, because these are very important topics. Um, I find it, I, I was very connected to the title of the book and a lot of the stories in it because um, our Creole in Jamaica was, when I was growing up, was called a broken language, right? Mm -hmm. And today it's being pushed as a language. They have Bibles written in Jamaican Creole that we call Patwa. And there is a change and a shift that is taking place. So what I took from it is, another interpretation of the term, my broken language, that there can be pride in your broken language because you can piece these different aspects from different cultures together and claim it. So, ha -ho. Um, oh, thank you very much. Um, these, the, the wonderful the discussion, you know, I wish that we had more time, uh, but right now we're gonna open it up to Q&A and if you have any questions, I will try my best. I will facilitate the questions. I will try my best just to go right down the list of all the questions uh, that you write in the chat. So if you could please post your questions that you would like to ask um, for uh, either uh, Chief Kalan or for uh, the Al Castellan or both, uh, just, let, just write it down in the chat. There's any questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna read this right here. Thinking about Virginia, Kiara, um, Alegria, Ulis, mom. Yep, Virginia Sanchez, I know, <laughs> um, who identifies as Taino, uh, is also a Yubra priest, uh, priestess. And also thinking about the Garifana and other peoples who have recognized many times in the discussion today, I'd like to ask if our honored guests want to speak to the connections between the first indigenous nations of the Caribbean and the African peoples who were enslaved and escaped slavery and settled in the islands. Connections both historically and today. Thank you. Very good question. I would you I'll go. <laughs> All right, as I said, the mural behind me is from Charlestown Maroon community. The word Maroon comes from Simarabo, which is dealing with the flight of an arrow, which was a term that all indigenous ancestors coined from Lokono for the individuals that escaped from slavery into the hills. So the first Simarabo were our indigenous ancestors and they created communities with those who had African ancestry. And what has happened here on the island and similar with Garifuna or Garinagu community is that a unique community was created because I've heard stories from Maroon elders that said that when they met professors from Ghana, 
and they were speaking what is called Cromantia language because the Maroons in Jamaica have their own language. They were saying that they were speaking ancient Twi, right? So an older version. So there's this pocket of retention and evolution that took place in this community, similar to what happened with us on the islands, because that is another show and another story completely of, you know, this, the understanding that I've learned of the island Arawakan people who were also different groups of indigenous people that were traveling and mixed and created a subgroup or subculture. And then, you know, it evolved from there. So yes, that happened. Why did that happen? Because we have a lot of similar values, similar understanding and similar views. Um, does, you know, it create conflict or issues? No, only if, you know, colonization has allowed that and you decide to subscribe to that. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging and honoring all aspects of who you are as an individual. At the end of the day, you, you, you are identifying as Caribbean. You're identifying as someone who is connected to the island and the medicines and the teachings that are on the island, right? As I said before, your grandmother's teachings, not just those from the 1300, but your grandmother's teachings are also yours to protect and to preserve. So if your grandma danced Punta or she danced Kumina or Cromanti, that is your heritage. And that is something for you to preserve, to protect and to promote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pasipe. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna go right down the line. And again, this is for Gazike Talan. What part of Jamaica is your community located in? My community is located in several parts of Jamaica. So let me explain how that works. Um, for us, we have sacred sites and then our communities have developed and have strong retention along these sacred sites. So to name a few places in Jamaica for those that are coming here, Yes, we have relatives in the Maroon communities, that is one, right? So that's Charlestown, Moortown, Scotts Hall, um, Akompong, all of these Maroon communities and Flagstaff. Then you have the fishing villages that are also part of our communities, which is Treasure Beach in St. Elizabeth. There is St. Anne, which is where Discovery Day is, where Columbus first arrived on this island. There is St. Mary, which is up in the mountains, the Blue and Janko Mountains, and in Nigril another one of our fishing villages. A lot of these spaces have sacred caves, sacred sites, semis that our community members protect. And what we've done as part of our calendar, it's very so extensive, is that we try to add support ceremony and um, promote these different indigenous spaces throughout the island. Because we have to remember that the entire island, you know, was inhabited with indigenous people here. So or surviving means that we're dispersed throughout the island. I reside in St. Andrew and there are some ceremonies that we'll gather for in St. Andrew, but like June 21st, the Yukahuna Kachiareto is going to be in Charlestown, which is in Portland, where we'll have other communities as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. And Emily uh, had also added, who asked, asked her earlier question, uh, the word sounds like uh, cimarrone. So, so what is it, cimarrbo? So, what, what? Okay, so that was a, a Lobono word. Okay, if you can write that down for us, um, Kasike, if you can write that down in the chat so everybody can look that up. So that's probably where the word cimarron comes from, perhaps. Yeah. So here goes another word. That's an Arawak word that we didn't know. <laughs> So um, I'm gonna go right down. Um, what was the name of the sust sustainability group, Vasike, uh, that you plugged earlier? It Planet Food, Planet and Food. What Planet was? Classroom. Planet Classroom. Could That's you me. write that down as well? All right. Yes. Thank you so much. And um, this one might go for uh, to uh, Elder Gassian. Um, how does one go about finding out the indigenous uh, dances of Borikin? And do we still have these dances today? We had these dances, but in secret. But now, today, the Yucayekas, you know Priscilla, 
about the different yuga yegas and they practice their dances. Um, the different groups that uh, yuga yegas that practice their dancing is part of their ritual. And if you, some of them are open to the public as far as seeing what they look like. And if you don't, if you want to go as far as joining them or talking to their leadership, then you could do so. But yes, they do, they do, uh, they do their dances quite often and they're open to the public. Different yuka yegas have different, uh, different uh, dances and what they mean. You could even catch some of them at powwows in, in the States. So it's pretty cool. It really is. You, you could find them. Thank you very much. Can I, can I add to that too? I wanna to give to, uh, some folks to ponder this one. Um, when I was looking uh, at some, it was uh, some Lokono dances actually, and there's these line dances that they do where they hold hands and they kind of like sway back and forth in a rhythmic um, fashion. And I was thinking, I was like, wow, where did I see this before? I don't know if, uh, if any of you all um, dance abosados. Abosados, Did you ever, did anybody dance that dance as a kid? I, I see somebody there. <laughs> I think it's like my, I'm first generation here. I was born here, but my, my, you know, my family's from Borica. So like I'm first generation here. So yeah, I remember dancing that. So it's a children's dance. So I think that some of these dances actually with the parent teaching the child these dance and they kept like, oh, it's a children's dance, you know, but it's, it's the same, look it up, look it up, look up some Lugono, um kind of like line dancing and yes, yeah, the same thing. It's the swaying back and forth and all this other stuff. So yes, Cacique, uh, Galan, you have your hand raised? Yeah, and you know, for us that are a part of the resurgence, again, the book is broken language, our language. Um, indigenous, movement, indigenous dances, all of us have that. It's what's birthed on our island. So if you're talking about ancestral, then that's different. But we all have indigenous dances on, on our island. We have indigenous music on our island that you've grown up listening to that people will call Boricua music, right? So it's to be conscious of that as, as well. You know, We have to be the ones that are using the language appropriately so that it can be shared appropriate. So indigenous, yeah, we have that. You know, indigenous didn't end in 1492, it continued. So we can find the ancestral roots to some of our indigenous things today. And yes, it will have indigenous to the Americas, may have European indigenous and may have African indigenous in the aspects of what we call Caribbean or island indigenous movements, dancing, songs, etc. today. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go right to the next question. I love your comment on the significance of land-based education. Uh, this is from Chris. Uh, I'm, an I'm an educator who is interested in knowing how to support the integration of indigenous educational practices into instruction and general academic program coordination. I'm curious to see how a reimagined educational experience for the Caribbean and Taino descendants in the diaspora would look like. I feel a bit disconnected, but eager to know how to create an educational program that uplifts and addresses modern learning needs of current Tainos in the Caribbean and in the US. Do you have any suggestions or advice for me? Uh, anybody would like to take that up? I'll, I'll answer since my hand was still up. <laughs> All right, my suggestion for that. To start is first connecting with communities that you can clearly see they have a model that is working, right? Um, a lot of communities may have the theory, but they may not have the know-how and the skill sets to get it up and running. And honestly, I would not recommend for you to get yourself involved in you know, things like that at this stage. You seem very motivated and you have a lot of, you have the mind and the heart to get it done. So what you need is the hands and the feet. 
and what is best to find communities that are doing that. And these models and these things already exist. Guyana is part of the Caribbean. Suriname is part of the Caribbean. There's a tendency to forget about the route that our ancestors took. Trinidad is part of the Caribbean. They, they have these things that are working models that exist that are about protecting the rainforest, that are about um, working with the waters and the rivers. And is really to see how best that you can create a model that can work in your community. So invite them. They could do with that exchange and that income to help and to show how they get these things running. Currently, uh, there is a program that has been successful in Guyana, just using it as an example. It's called Red Plus, and it is one of these initiatives that's dealing with climate change. And it, it speaks towards this concept of reducing carbon emissions, right? And what they did was they took a lot of the indigenous children that understood the forest. So on their maps, there were a lot of spaces that they, that they had no name for it what the indigenous community members had names for it, because these are places that they'd have to visit when they're going on their hunting trails or they're going fishing. So they'd have you know, indigenous names for these spaces. So they gave them the task and taught them how to use the equipment to map and to protect the environment. And I don't know why they were surprised at how well our indigenous youth were doing it. So here you have the forestry, protecting of the forestry being integrated with um, IT and computer knowledge because they had to be learning about using these gadgets and how they could use them given their indigenous spaces and their desires and their ways of being in the rainforest to protect the rainforest, to map what is going on. And then there is income generated with the Red Plus program. So that is something else um, that exists out there where based on the amount of tons of carbon um, trees that are planted or protected, there's actually income that goes into the community. So what I'm saying is that there are models that work. It's just to widen the scope of where you're looking. So hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, right down the, uh, right here, the chat, we have uh, Tamaris asking, uh, if we can visit Jamaica, how can we connect and learn from uh, Kasike Galan? Uh, Jessica, do you have like a some information? And this actually goes for um, uh, Elder Cassian as well. Uh, if you all can uh, provide everyone your uh, contact information or websites or anything like that that people can connect with you, um, that would be really great. They could see your artwork. They could see a lot of the the programs that you're doing. And please add that in the chat for us. So we can take a look. So that's wonderful, thank you. And I'm gonna go right down to Alex because we have about 15 more minutes. I wanna get all these questions in. Um, Alex uh, has provided a link to Miguel Sage, another person that has been in the Taino um, movement for a very, very long time. Uh, wrote a great blog on, on the history of Taino dance. Thank you, Aham, for adding that. And we have, we have a question here for Cassian. Uh, can you talk more about res res restoration and revitalization as Taino people? Restoration, well, the bottom line is that you gotta understand that you are Taino find like-minded people like I did. And then what is important is to want to restore. How do you fit within this community? Because that's what's actually, that's what you're participating in. You're, you're part of a community now. Me, I find it through ceramics and through art. That's my restoration, okay? Other people could be through music. If you're into photography, photograph Taino people. Seriously, Taino people it, with, without regalia and document them like many other cultures that have done in, in the past. Documentation is very important. It, you don't have to be professional, you know? We're, none of us are professional. We didn't go to a, some people think that they did, but they went to a Taino university and you know, that's not true. You, that's how you restore, you know, because before we're Taino, 
we're trying to restore. So our kids and our and our children in the future will have a uh, will identify and will have less problems in the future to identify as being Taino. Hammock making, I was, you know, that was a big deal for me. Uh, I don't do it because it just takes too much time. But for other people, you know, to restore, what would, you know, what, you know, something about uh, getting recognition, something like getting land, that's been talked about forever. In the, 1980, in the late 80s, people were talking about land. What would we do on that land? What would, what would produce for us what our ancestors did on that land? That's, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about real restoration. And that's been going on at, up till recently. You know, We all know about what the Virgin, Virgin Islands recognized a group of Taino people. Huh? What that means, I don't know. Me personally, I don't know what the Virgin Island government is going to do for those people. You know, uh, I told a lot of Tainos in the past that we in Puerto Rico should have done that huh? because the Virgin Islands has the same system that we do. They have a governor huh? and, they, and they answer to Congress. So uh, we should have been able to be doing that, you know, because we had the numbers. Um, and look, instead of looking at 75 percent of uh, of uh, what we lost, look at what we've gained. We, there's a lot of, and you know this more than I do, there's a lot of Native American groups, Native American tribes that are recognized by the government that have less information about their ancestors and their tribal uh, uh, practices than we did, than we do. Huh? Um, we have to get involved and we not just, the first step is knowing who you are, knowing and going forth and recognize because everybody talks about uh, everybody's right to uh, to affirm themselves. Huh? We have all the, all this, especially in the states. You always talk about groups affirming. Well, the problem is that when we affirm ourselves, there's a problem, you know. And we have to uh, we have to forget about what others think and go forward. And basically, it's just going forward and doing what we got to do. If you recognize that, if you find out that you're Taino, you're gonna just on a casual. Don't make it an obsession. Just find out your history, identify, visit the Caribbean. Everybody wants to visit everywhere else, but people don't want to visit the Caribbean. I got a problem with Taino folks. When was the last time you, the last time that you came to, uh, to Bori Gang? Oh, and Titi Fela died 10 years ago. There's a ceremony, there are two ceremonial grounds here. Nobody wants to visit them? Oh no, but we're Taino though, you know. That's why make it a yearly pilgrimage, you know? Take those shoes off. You're walking on, on sacred land. Your ancestors walked that land. You know, look at the landscape on those mountains. One, a, long time, a, a long time ago, your ancestors were looking at the same mountain range. So if you wanna, if you really want to, you have to know who you are. Um, be proud of it and identify with it. it there's, no, there's nothing wrong. I don't understand some Puerto Ricans, they get upset when they say that when we identify, but you can identify as being Puerto Rican. Nobody cares. You know, nobody's going to debate you. You know, we have three governors in Puerto Rico that have dual citizenship with Spain. Dual citizenship with Spain. Sila Calderon uh, and two other ones. The last one was, uh, I forgot what the other, the last one was, but they, they, they have dual citizenship with Spain. Nobody, nobody has a problem with that. You know? So if, uh, if, they, if, they, if there isn't a problem with that, we have a, a tremendous African, um, African community in Puerto Rico. It's beautiful. They have literature, poetry. Um, they have uh, 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 music, spirituality. They have land. Uh, they have Loisa. Uh, you ever been there? They have food. They're a it's a beautiful culture. And it's an African culture. You know, nobody got a problem when they identify with that culture. As soon as they identify with Taino, there's a problem. Oh, who are you? But well, that's what we have to, we're going to have to deal with that. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, the chief has that problem in Jamaica also when he identifies some people are, what? You know, you know, so it's not an easy road, but it's one that we could do it. And I believe that we can do it. And uh, if you really, 
want to find your people, you're going to find them, you know, like I did, you know, it wasn't an accident, but I, I was shocked, you know, but uh, we're there, you know, and we have to have more goals centered around continuing our restoration, because that's what it is. We are restoring, you know, what we lost. And we're restoring our identity. We have every right, and we don't have to ask anybody's permission to identify we're being Taino. And yes, there are mixed bloods also in Native American reservations. Huh? When they start with that nonsense, I've heard it 20 years, 30. Ah, but you know, you're mixed, and who, who's a pure blood? Huh? Nobody is. Really? Hmm? You know, that's a big problem. Hmm? And the Taino community, they think that because uh, you're half European or half black or, 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 or you're 50% this or whatever, that you can't say that you're Taino. Who said that? Who said that? Even Europeans aren't 100%. Some are French, some are British. Nobody argues with them about that. Uh, but our people, an elder once told me we're the only people on the, on the planet that have to prove who we are. You ask an Asian guy, what are you, oh, Japanese? Do you argue with them? Oh, wait, are you sure you're not half? But are you pure? Where are you from? No, that's us. So yes, it's a hard road, but it's, it's, we, have to, we, have to, we have to struggle. We have to struggle like other Native Americans. We have to understand that we are connected to them and we have their same history. It's the truth. So that's what be to, to restore and to find out you, that's the steps that you got to go through. And it's not an easy road, but it's, it's one that you're going you're gonna to benefit from. You're going to learn a lot from. So you, Priscilla, you've been on this road, right? How many years? A little over 20, 25. Ah, there you go. Huh? Did you quit? No. Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, that's what restoration is about, people. And the chief is going through that. We are going through that. And we are going to, and it was worse 20 years ago than it is now. And it's still bad now. You know, you're still going to be made, for, but keep going forward because we're working for our children and we're working for, you know, our children's children. And yes, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Um, it really is. It, it's, it, I, it was worse for me, man. We had, you guys got a press of a button. We have to do research in libraries. And spend fifty dollars on dimes and the Xerox and Xerox and all that's, that. That was our. That was what we had to do. We. I, I lived in New York City in the sleet and the snow. It wasn't easy, but we did it. Now you guys press of a button, you know, and you know. But we should be gathering more together as a community. We we know we're not going to love each other. Not all of us, but. We're, we're a community, we have to be a community and we have to get together uh, to make this happen. And whatever happens and whatever they say, you gotta combat it, you know? There's a lot of problems that people try to bring to us. A lot of, there's a lot of jealousy among other people here in Puerto Rico. Ah, que tu eres indio, eh que? What's the problem? They're, they're very, some people are really, they don't like, well, what are you saying that you're an Indian, you know? I don't know, nobody turned around and told them that we didn't take anything away from them. But that's, that's what we have, that's, far, that's 500 years of colonization. So, but I'm going forward, Priscilla's going forward and other people on here are going forward that I know, I, I know not personally, but I know that they've been in the community for quite a long time. So let's keep going forward, man. I'm gonna keep doing my ceramics. I'm here with Priscilla talking with you guys. So, We'll see. I hope I answered your question. I think I think no, that's really awesome. That thank you very much. I remember those days of um, you know when I did some research. I, I was doing a lesson plan um, back in nineteen in ninety nine about Taino people, uh, the art lesson plan, and uh, I was trying to look for information. I went to Taller Potrequeño. There was but so much information there. And then they directed me to the library at Six and Lehigh here in Philadelphia in La Hooking. And, and they brought out a box. Like there was no computer system, they brought out a box. It was a dusty old box. I opened up the box, you know, see Philadelphia is so way behind New York anyway. 
it's like it's like way behind New York when it comes to that. So yeah, but thank you very much. Um, I didn't want to take too much time, but I wanted to go back onto the chats. Um, we have the two groups planet classroom that was uh, added by Jessica Galan, the Protect Our Planet Movement org uh, link. Um, Alba, which I really agree with this comment, the indigenous people, indigenous peoples of your area should also be connected with. If you're in diaspora, if you're not in the Caribbean, um, you know, it, if you're in diaspora, you should also kind of connect with the native folks uh, who are the original caretakers of of the land that you that you occupy. So, um, reach out like I. There's the Lenny Lenape here, the Natico Lenny Lenape, the Lenny Lenape Nation of um, uh, Delaware, uh, the Ramapo uh, Lenape in New Jersey. So, like, yeah, reach out and say hello. And uh, we have some information here. Kassian, did you uh, add some information? Could you do that for me? Because I'm on the I'm on the I'm on the telephone. Your phone? Okay. Let's see here. I will do that. And then we have here uh, this uh, link was added here. Uh, thank you for Emily. Uh, trying to find information online, but I uh, heard about mathematic curricula um, that connects with Latin American indigenous cultural practices and teaching and learning math. This is really great. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that PDF. We have Javi who says, you know, man, all this uh, conversation makes you <laughs> want to get out to work with your hands and move with your feet. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Cacique from Indy uh, for sharing contact information. Um, let's see here. Yes, uh, Alex says, Thank you. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> Patricia says, yeah, but I don't like hot sun, water, and sand. I don't know. Maybe go, I, I, I don't know. Maybe just go visit the islands. You know, no, not, not all of it is hot. Not all of it is hot. You know, you just go out in the mountains and it's really nice and chill. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Yep, these indigenous nations on the East Coast, uh, Dr. Darlene had had added, uh, many don't go by blood, they go by genealogy, and some of them don't go by blood quantum. So, and they're federally recognized tribes. Uh, I can name like what, the Shinnecock do that, especially they go by lineage. Um, so we have uh, Grandma Google. This is, <laughs> you know, I think there's a thing on TikTok right now. There's this huge thing on TikTok talking about how like, People are just like Googling stuff and, and now they're experts. So yes, Google is free. However, it should not be your only resource. <laughs> Talk to people in the community, <laughs> you know? So that's <laughs> that's a must. Um, Alba adds, uh, had to go uphill both ways to the library. Yes, you know, in the snow. Uh, ho -ho. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think it's hard for me to identify saying, you know, as I'm only 15% um, and 50% uh, Spanish and, and Portuguese. But again, you know, um, we don't do blood quantum, but you know, we don't do blood quantum. That's like really such a, um, it's, it, it's a, it's a U.S. thing. It's a, a United States thing, Canada thing. It's a colonizer thing, you know, what they're trying to do is they're trying for us to like kind of marry out and be no more. So, and in their head, but we're still here. Um, thank you for tying the library. Thank you, Kiriaki. Uh, let's see here. Chris says, um, hey, <laughs> I love a series of these Sanyo centered discussions. Thank you, Chris. Um, are there any additional recommendations for somebody like me trying to connect and find? Uh, we were talking about Taino Library. Uh, so Taino Library is a great resource, uh, vetted um, resource. Uh, they are on Facebook, they are on Instagram, and they are on TikTok. TikTok is like so super fun. 
<laughs> and I think I think on uh, Twitter as well. So, uh, but Elp is here. So if you go just, all you have to do is just at Taino Library and, and there you go. Um, let's see, Dusty John, who's it, who's it? <laughs> Dusty John. <laughs> That's some Philadelphia speech. John is, is, is an everything word. It's a noun uh, that means everything. It's a person, place, or thing. So must be a Dusty person. <laughs> I don't know what this was referring to. It must have been a discussion earlier. Is the recording going to be sent to us? Yes. And this was a question that was actually sent to me in, privately. The recording is going to be sent to everyone who had registered. Yes. Um, and let's go right down. Ah, and thank you, Elba, for giving us um, uh, Elder Kassian's um, information. Thank you very IG much. And FB. Thank you very much, Iris. Thank you. And uh, yes, Kalan. I just want to speak briefly towards Patricia's question because that's a question and a concern that many people have and just wanted to touch on that aspect of restoration. Restoration for people is, you know, not the same like a painting or pottery or a video. It's healing right and to heal adequately we have to understand what is at the root of the issue that we're carrying and sometimes what happens most for most of us in the caribbean is that somewhere along the line someone hurt that indigenous identity in our family line and that hurt was so great that one of our ancestors didn't want us to go through that experience so in that space of pain, they didn't allow us to even connect with that part of who we are. Because it hurt so much to have it and have to hide it that they had preferred for you to not have it at all. And we knowing better are on that path to reconnect and to heal it for future generations. So every step that you're taking on this journey, as my brother Louis said, is important and needs to be recorded, right? Um, what it feels like, what you're going through, the, the struggles that you're having recorded, please make a note, please do this for the future generation. As more information becomes present, it's the easier it will be. My, my ancestors didn't have DNA tests to have these discussions about blood quantum. That didn't exist for them. It didn't, right? So they had this pain and now there are things that are possible for us to do, to work through it. As my brother said, what is it that makes you indigenous? What, what is it really to identify as indigenous? Indigenous is connected to the land. Visit your ancestral land. Go to the spaces. You want to know who is community? You go to the bate and look for the people who are taking care of the bate and paying attention to the bate and ask them questions. It doesn't matter. Chances are most of the time they won't even be wearing regalia. I've had that experience. I've, I've confirmed a lot of things that I've learned in my family about uh, tobacco and ceremonies, and all these things. And these people, they, they were dressing up in regalia and singing and dancing. This is who they are. They, they didn't have to try and prove it externally. So forget about that Hollywood concept and ground your concept of who you are. When you're thinking of what it is to be indigenous, think of that grandmother that probably wanted to share so much, but didn't, and she had her reasons. Honor her first. And then you will be able to heal those aspects of yourself that you don't feel so connected to. Here in Jamaica, our story was that the Spanish, the Spanish as a group of colonizers, right, had their mandate and their edict. But people are people, and remember that as well, that we each have our own journey and our own role. Don't assume because you have 50% of Spanish blood that all Spanish people are evil people. And because you had whatever percentage of Portuguese blood that all of these people are evil people. On our island, when we had the Spanish colonizers, they came here, they didn't bring women. They intermarried with community people here. They had families here. And when the British came to protect their families, they told them that Tell these people that you're Caucasian or tell them that you're this or tell them that you're that. 
and they won't trouble you. They'll leave you alone. And some of them went to Cuba and left their family here and their family was protected. That doesn't take away the fact that colonization was a horrible thing, but this concept of broad brushing, don't do that to yourself. Don't assume that every European in your line was an evil person. Because if that was the case, chances are you wouldn't be in this space right now, connecting with these people right now, having this discussion right now. All of you had to agree to be here. Your heart couldn't want to be here and your mind telling you no, and you're here listening to this conversation. So for whoever it is, one person voiced it, but I know this is a common concern, right? Healing. Go to the spaces, as my brother said, he gave you the first tip, sacred space. Take off your shoes, ground, just sit there, just listen, just observe. We don't have cookies here. You have cookies there. Listen to them. What are they saying? What does it sound like? Does it seem familiar? Is there something coming from your dream? We'll talk about blood memory here a lot. Have discussions about dreams. There are some things that might be coming through your dreams. Ask elders, if you dream this, what does it mean? If you dream that, what does it mean? What does this mean to you? Leave Grandma Google alone. Talk to people. And you'd be surprised how through opening up like that, everything comes to you. So please, um, don't bash yourself. You are where you're supposed to be. And it is because of your ancestors, all of them, that you are here and we're able to have these conversations. So how home to all of you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Wow. Home. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would like to thank our guests. Um, Elder uh, Luis uh, Calder I'm saying Calderon. Luis Calderon. I, I was my fault. I didn't write down Cassian Calderon. Luis Cassian. You could just call me Cassian. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Cacique uh, Calan. And I would like to uh, thank also the, the Philadelphia Library. Uh, and Brittany for helping us uh, facilitate this and put this all together. I would also like to thank, um, you know, the Philadelphia One Book and uh, My Broken Language and the author, uh, Kiara um, Alegria uh, Hudes, who came and, and wrote this amazing, beautiful story. If you all haven't read this book, please read this book. Uh, it, it touches on so many different subjects. So uh, I don't know. I, I think we're going to close this out, Brittany. Thank you very much. I think we're a little over time. I love this space. You know, I look out for uh, Elder Scrolls and because and <laughs> I love to just listen to these stories. Uh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you uh -huh, very much. And I, Bid you a wonderful evening. Blessings, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. No. Amazing, Priscilla. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know it's like, it's so, it's so hard. <laughs> Luis Calderon, hola, hola, hola. You were amazing, Priscilla. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I always get tongue tied. I'm actually literally tongue tied. I have like tongue is like attached to the bottom. So sometimes there's some words and everything like that's very hard for me to get out. So I apologize for that ahead of time. So you were wonderful. This was amazing. And thank you. I will, um, yeah, I will send the recording out to everybody who registered because I know there's folks who registered who couldn't make it. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Love Bye. you guys. Bye.